Hi, I'm Kyle. I am here to talk about scientific computing and closure. Is that a bait and switch? You'll see. Um, there's, there will be some fun stuff. Um, this will be a little less about showing closure code and more about walking you through some problems. Uh, so what is scientific computing? Um, uh, here's a very nice, wonderfully broad definition of it's just using computational methods, algorithms to solve some scientific problems. So it covers a lot and things we run into on a daily basis. Uh, and so just using, reusing a saying from my algorithms professor, actually, uh, algorithms are just a bag of tricks. Scientific computing is just another bag of tricks in many ways. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, sci so scientific computing is just uh, another bag of tricks where we get into for focusing on sci scientific problems. Better? Uh, all right. So why use closure for scientific computing? In data science, you hear about the wars between Python and R. No one ever mentions closure. It always upsets me. Um, so that is kind of true in scientific computing. Scientific computing tends to lag a bit behind things. It's fairly heavy on simulation, so you'll run into very frequently, I've, I've spent a summer dealing with Fortran code, um, but you know, C++ is actually still owns a lot of the business of scientific computing. Um, but closure, you know, it's concise. I don't have to sell closure here, but it, the interop does matter a lot, and the ability to get to C++ code matters a lot, um, because sometimes we're connecting directly to microscopes, uh, et cetera. Um, and my code is almost always messier than anyone here, anywhere in here would ever approve of. Um, but it cleans up nice because it's closure. All right, so I'm going to tell this as four stories. Um, so first, we'll go through artificial life. Uh, it's a little bit of a, well, no, that's actually a pretty strong connection. A physical chemical computer that we've just recently finished. Um, connecting patterns to perception of visual system um, that is starting to connect to closure now and computational vascular biology. I'm not going to be presenting closure code for all of these, but uh, closure was used fairly heavily in all of these except the physical chemical computer, what, which I just think people here would be interested in. All right, so artificial life, and this does get a bit at the heart of scientific computing. So artificial life, what is the point of it? The point of it is to use computer to replace your pipettes, your microscope, et cetera. You just consolidate everything from a biological lab into a, into a computer, and then you go run off into artificial life. You simulate cells, et cetera. Um, and I just have to put up this, the digesting duck, because I, I think that's a wonderful example of early artificial life. You know, it, it consumes grain, it defecates, and that's life. <laughs> Okay, so I got started in artificial life because of Lee Spector, actually, who he's giving a talk tomorrow. You, you'll see him on that. Um, but he introduced me to artificial life because I was studying artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence, you know, they made a bunch of promises never delivered, and why? Well, because the brain and the body are connected, so maybe you should study both at the same time. So you get into artificial life, and then you have a whole bunch of other problems that come up, like molecules, how they actually contribute to intelligence, et cetera. Um, but here, briefly, so we played a lot with these evolving virtual creatures. Um, and this is a simulation in Breve, which was at the time in a scripting language, Steve, but it's in Python and C++ engine. Anyway, I'll get to the closure version in a bit. Um, but so you evolve these creatures, you let them walk, they have very simple controllers, you measure which ones can go further, and you select for those in a population and repeat you eventually get these nice walkers. Uh, so then I joined a robotics lab and we started making them. Um, and it's still in the same Breve simulator. And this was just a, a simple study to compare two different morphologies. It turns out in this case, the radial one was able to walk further. Um, but the lesson learned from this, if anyone's interested in going this angle, is robotics takes a lot of time. Um, you know, you're spending a lot of time assembling these things when you know you could be coding them up and you could spam a whole bunch to a cluster, and as opposed to spending you know a whole weekend just designing one of these. Um, so that's my take on robots, but clearly have, they have practical in, implications. Swarms. Okay. So many of you have probably seen this video. You know, flocking starlings. Um, 
you know, they have very simple, well, the argument is they're using very simple rules in order to uh, follow very, form these cohesive behaviors where everyone moves collectively. Um, the rest of the video is in, as interesting as the demo, so I'll just keep doing that. Um, so I ported this and this over the Breve simulator into Clojure Breves, if you want to play with it. This is, uh, I should have a video here, but apologies. Um, so, but we can do some flocking simulations here. How do swarms work? I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly. Um, but so swarms, they have these very simple behaviors. You have these coefficients where you, you wait which direction you go based on what's your nearest neighbor, what's the kind of centroid of mass of your neighbors around you, and you can add some like, uh, well, alignment is an important one to get the whole flock to move in the same direction. Uh, and this comes from yeah, Craig Reynolds' work on Boyd's. So you can play with all of this in, in closure with that Brevis simulator if you'd like. Um, I was tasked this past summer with teaching students Python. I know this isn't closure. I know, I'm sorry. Um, but everything aside from this was closure. So I, you know, inside these little agents, I put little Jython interpreters because the, the point of this class was it was being given by someone who didn't know closure but, but knew Python, wanted to teach people Python. Um, so what I did was, you know, fine, you can write Python, but you're using closure for everything else. So they just did this little thing where, you know, you color your agents based on where they are, and you know, it's kind of small, but you have these red, green or red and blue stripes that come out uh, with this little Python function that's getting called every iteration based as these birds fly around. Um, so this is all in, uh, hooked up to that Brevis simulator. I'm going, this is a little bit of a history at the, to lead to where we are now. Um, so in this Breve simulator, we were studying the evolution of signaling. Um, so this, this very clever student at Brandeis was working on, well, if you have this world where you have energy particles, some of them might actually deplete your energy, some might provide you energy. These agents can fly around. Uh, you can ask Ali about genetic programming tomorrow, but they're using genetic programming here. And they have the ability to send signals to their neighbors in order to alert them, oh, I've just eaten a poisonous food. Uh, so we did this, we did a whole bunch of simulations, and we saw, oh wow, the, we, we found some particular cases where we got what seemed like signaling to emerge. So we would start, well, in order to know that signaling was a, was a reasonable thing, we started charging costs to communication. You know, because why would you not communicate if it didn't cost you anything? You might as well just babble as much as you'd like. Um, so here we started charging costs, you know, so they're sacrificing their life to communicate. So we, we were able to find in the evolutionary trajectories, we ran these for fairly long amounts of time, we found this, like, these bursts of signaling emerging in the population. But then, how can you make a causal statement about what the signaling, what is leading to the signaling? So then we ended up just doing a whole bunch of game theory, and that turned out to be MATLAB, and MATLAB is awful if you've had to use it. It's, it's basically C++. Uh, well, it's basically C, kind of, uh, with some, some stuff for matrices. Um, so, we'd and so after that, the Brevis simulator was made. Um, another cute thing that we did that was interesting, do you care? Yes, maybe, because uh, this type of controller, you could imagine scaling it to a type of distributed system, which many people are dealing with here. Um, so here you have a world, um, I'll, I'll, I have a manual simulation, a manual animation of this in a second. Um, so you have this world, you have these tiles, they're still following a similar like flocking type of algorithm, and these tiles have the ability to apply forces to the birds. The point is, you have these energy particles scattered in the world, and you want to do some load balancing between them. You don't want too many agents consuming an energy source if there are too many agents there because that energy source will become over depleted, et cetera. So we just do a simple a PID controller. It comes from the Navy for driving ships. Um, so you see, so green, it doesn't come out great, but is attracting a bunch of birds. Blue is repelling birds. So you can see that in areas where you have more birds, it's starting to repel them. It's attracting birds to these areas where you have lower densities. OK, so that was in Breves. Now, completely jumping to the next story. Physical chemical computer. So this is a fun one that we just finished up very recently. Um, and so some simulations were done in Brevis for this as well. Um, but the story here is more, much more about the actual physical system that we're talking about. 
So there's this reaction called the belozhov jabotinsky reaction. It was discovered in the Soviet Union when this guy was trying to model the citric acid cycle, you know, trying to model one of the most fundamental reactions to, to cells. Um, so he was tossing in, coming up with a bunch of different concoctions, mixing them up, tossing them under a microscope, didn't get it to work. One day he wanders off, he comes back, he sees this faint yellow luminescence. It's not luminescence, but a faint yellow color in the dish. And so that, that's basically what you're seeing here in, in, the, in the corner, um, is that this, this reaction is autocatalytic. It will spontaneously start to oscillate. It, I mean, it's not defying thermodynamics. It actually consumes acid as an energy source. Um, but you can see that this is a, these are two different time points. This is at the very top. You know, I took a silver wire, and in my Petri dish, I drew a demo because I was in the lab I was in. It was called Demo. And you wait a little bit, and these spirals start to form out. And so this is just a natural part of this chemical reaction. So I, I was working with the physics lab, and they designed a custom microscope. And uh, also, they're a microfluidics lab, so they're very good at taking that entire reaction in the Petri dish and putting it into individual droplets, where you don't actually, the droplets are small enough, uh, the tenth of a millimeter, um, sometimes less. Uh, and such that you don't actually get these waves propagating through. The, the drops will just turn bright or turn off, turn bright or turn off. Um, and so we, start, we actually use those as our computational elements. So we have this fancy microscope where you can observe what's happening in your collection of drops and you can control it, put light onto it. And so we had this idea of, well, maybe you can actually make a NOR gate out of it. Uh, NOR gate, you know, you're, you're used to NAND gates in your computers, but NOR gate is almost as good for implementing other gates, NOR will always take one extra, one extra version of itself, but it is still a Turing universal gate. Um, so this is kind of what the system looks like naturally. You have a bunch of these perfectly perfect drops that come out. Uh, the little triangles in between your drops are, are oil, and there's a little phenomena about which chemical species move through there, but basically these, you get these droplets and they couple together. So, I think I started those videos now. So you have these videos running on the side where we take a collection of three droplets. The two outer droplets are our inputs to our gate. The center drop is our, is our output. And we can control the light on it, and we just pulse light in order to send an input. And mind you, we're, we're talking about minutes here, generally. So you're not going to be writing your closure interpreter on this yet. Um, <laughs> So, but it's, it's still kind of cute because, you know, if we were struck by an EMP, then our closure interpreters would go down, and now you could start to port it over here. <laughs> um, okay, so, so we do this, and so we basically read within a particular frame whether you get a spike, and that's how you get your output out of your, of your chemical logic gate. Um, and so, but uh, a kicker of this is because the acid is their, is their fuel source, they eventually will burn through all their fuel, and these gates decrease in quality over time. That's not particularly surprising from a, from a wet system. And just a demo of just kind of what happens. You can see there's some spon moderate spontaneous activity outside of the field of view, but here you're looking at eight different logic gates being run at the same time with different combinations of inputs. Um, it's, I, know, I thought it was a cute system. I thought people would be interested. There's chemical computing has been floating around in the closure world recently. Okay, patterns to perception. So it turns out that, so some of you might know that the last thing Turing did uh, before he passed was to study, the, study embryogenesis, morphogenesis. So he developed a mathematical model to describe how you could form patterns in an embryo. Um, and this BZ reaction has actually been one of the physical systems they use as a model to actually represent this Turing system. It was recently shown that you could replicate all of Turing's math in this, in, in this specific system. Um, but Turing's, I mean, do you, yeah. So Turing's model has actually, it comes under some criticism. Um, I don't know how mathy people are here, but basically he, he, linearized, he linearizes his solution, so he excludes some nonlinear possibilities. Um, so we went through and kind of reiterated some of his work and using this idea of, well, 
what if you, instead of having chemical reactions, just use logic gates? Because we've started studying how to make them. So if you just use logic gates in a diffusion system, what type of patterns can you produce? And so we're able to kind of recapitulate all of Turing's patterns. Um, why does this get interesting? It gets interesting because of these next two steps. So at one point, I was working on uh, visual systems. Um, and, and so it was on this embryogenesis problem of how you can start with a single cell and grow it out into a full organism. So this was kind of pioneered by this very clever work by this guy, Fabian Roth, in Switzerland, where he grows out this neural system. I don't know if anyone here knows Breitenberg vehicles, maybe. Um, there are these kind of cool vehicles where you have two wheels, two sensors, and, you, and these are light sensors. And so you can move to, so you directly couple the, the sensory input to the motor, and you can then kind of imagine how if, if you, depending on how you wire your sensors to your motors, you will have different light sensing properties. So let's see, if you, have, if you cross your connections, then as this sensor gets closer to the light, you'll speed up and turn more towards it. So if you cross your sensors, you'll move towards light. If you, if you have your sensors wired in parallel, they'll move away from it. So this is a very clever system. He actually made a motor system in blue over there, you'll see, and, uh, and in red on the right in this fourth panel. Um, so these are sensor motor systems, and then he did some uh, actually genetic algorithms in order to evolve the axonal connections, and he made this kind of wiring, and so this little organism would kind of move like a little fungi around uh, in this world. So I, at one point I was handed this manuscript script in a draft and told to replicate it. Um, I got partway there. I didn't start making axons, but I started working on a vision system. Okay, where does that vision system go? It, it grows out, and there's some neat properties of that you can like blast some of the cells, and they'll recover because it's a reaction diffusion system, and they'll only grow if there are a, a certain if there's a certain level of chemicals in their environment. So if you kill off some of the cells, the chemistry depletes because none of the cells are producing it, and then the, the system will regrow. It's regrowing right now. Okay, so, oh, I didn't know that would start immediately. Okay, so this brings, to, uh, brings me to another thing. Uh, so this is, again, MATLAB. I apologize for bringing up MATLAB things, but basically I'm trying to port all my MATLAB to Clojure. Um, I don't say that snidely. I mean, it's not pleasant to work in. Um, so this, here's a co-evolving uh, camouflage and vision system. So you have these predators, they have actually, the, the predators have, it's actually modeled after a human vision system because I was, you know, I'm, I'm an academic. I was submitting this as a paper and I knew the reviewers were people. So I figured if my predators were people and they were evolving good camouflage, then the camouflage would match the things the reviewers couldn't see and they would be impressed. Uh, that was my strategy. Uh, it, I think it worked. Um, so you know, this, in the center, this is just kind of a feature map. You, you look at different orientations of objects, in your, well, not objects, of pixel. These are, these are pixel-based operations being performed. You look at different orientations, different color combinations, et cetera. And so you use an evolutionary algorithm to evolve the weights of this vision system. And on the other hand, you have these prey, which have these genetic programs inside that are actually producing these patterns like you saw happening over there on the right. Um, okay, so this kind of this and, and so we made these cool, this is what happens after the end of evolution. You know, we, we get some very, I, I think they're well matching um, because we randomly move the prey around so they will, they will never perfectly memorize the environment nearby them and actually how could they if they were occluding it? Um, maybe a little bit. But you know, we were able to get the blue, blue prey, we're able to kind of absorb kind of weight, well, to kind of emerge, the patterns of waves would emerge in the prey, in the, in the water, for example. And funky things happened on this kind of very artificial uh, lights type of background. But they always found circles of the right size, which I thought was cute. Okay, so what I've done then is, so there's this program, I, maybe some of you know it, Image J. Um, it has a long-standing history. It comes out of the NIH, but it's, you know, it's Java, so yay, closure. I can, I can touch, touch, get to closure from that. Um, so I've, I've been working on this library, Fun Image, where you can use closure to do, do a lot of Image J things, and there, there are a lot of other libraries behind it. And this Albert Cardona did some, some of the initial work that's helped this come together, and I've coupled it into the simulator so you can actually have simulations where 
your 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 flock can you know pr can pr be projected onto an image, and you can use this image to look at how your flock moved over time. Okay, I don't have a timer. I should have kept that. Uh, oh yes, and so I was giving a talk uh, down in Maryland recently, um, and so this was kind of my cute example. It was last month, so it was Halloween. Um, I should have updated it to turkeys, but so I, the, this was to a bunch of image processors. So. You know, they're used to writing long code for things. They're used to writing Java for things. You know? um, so I want to show them concise code that could do a lot. So what I did was you know, wrote this little thing. You, iterate, you, you map your function over a bunch of images. You concatenate them. You know, it's just basically a map reduce type of call. And you put hats on cats. And you know, this is my Halloween celebration. Um, OK, so this is a fun one. And this one you can use the libraries up and everything. Uh, so here, uh, I'll get to my main story, because this has kind of some of the coolest videos. Okay, so it, hopefully the, the, the model will be somewhat in inspirational anyway. So angiogenesis, the formation of blood vessels. Uh, it's studied in a lot of different places. We're generally talking about mice um, when, when they're studied, uh, but you know, we care about humans too, of course. Uh, so here you're looking at you know, a, a, young, a young retina sprouting and you have these blood vessels that grow. Clearly, we have lots of neurons there. We have to feed them with glucose. Um, so you have these three different primary phases of vascular development. You have the sprouting level where they kind of go random and kind of just get to, into the environment. They make too many connections generally. You know, this is similar for anything where you're making some sort of tree structure. You spam out a bunch of connections. Then you do some pruning process. And then eventually, you know, things, things are mature enough, you don't have to prune anymore. And so that's how, you're, that's how the blood vessels in your retina are formed. Um, oh, I'll mind you, uh, so, so there's actually a growth factor in, towards the periphery of your eye. Uh, that's that VEGF, the growth factor, and I'll get to that in a little bit as well. Um, and in the black, just because you might care, I don't know if it shows up, but those are astrocytes, so they're kind of neurons that help, help guide these blood vessels in their growth. So, this is, it's tough for this crowd because you're probably used to fancier images, but this is actually from, from a mouse eye. We actually went and we scanned the eye. We did 3D reconstructions of, of the blood vessels at this at pretty high resolution. Um, you know, and the, the point of this is to be able to get to the point of, well, we can start to model flow, model blood flow, what happens when you, when you occlude blood vessels, um, figure out where, where pressure builds up, where, where shear stress builds in, in the vascular networks. Uh, and so this is with this fancy uh, microscopy technique, light sheet microscopy you might run into. It's been getting a lot of, a lot of popular comments lately. But the point of all this is, so a lot of these people in, in this biology world, they'll, they'll analyze their images manually, and then you have computational biologists who generally will go up, they'll look up into a paper, well, how fast did cells move in this simulation? The, they'll basically be extracting not, they'll extract quantitative observations from, from other people's work, but it doesn't connect directly to the data. It's, you know, a biologist has gone through and measured a bunch of things by hand, and now the, bio, the computational person then goes and recapitulates these by taking those hand observations and making another image, and yet and they still tend not to match. So this notion of image-driven driven simulation is one of the things we've been working on recently. So can you just take an eye, scan it, and do a forward simulation, predict what would happen after, after a few days of development? Okay, so that, I mean, you're probably all comfortable with that in this world. Oh, so the simulation, let me talk about that a little bit. So we simulate cells. The nice thing about these vascular cells, the endothelial cells, is that blood vessels are actually, the walls of them are fairly thin compared to the actual vessel themselves, generally. When you're, when you're at the capillaries, that's not exactly true, but further back. So you can make an assumption, and the, you know, sci scientific computing is riddled with these, of you know, well, what, is, what can I assume is a very, very small thing so I can start to factor out that dimension in, in my data? Uh, so we assume these cells are flat. Um, and they're connected by springs, and so the cells are modeled by a bunch of, this is an agent-based simulation. So it's a collection of these. They're tethered by springs. Um, they have the, yeah, so I'll show you the, the growth of these into a new media, but they also have these things called philopodia, where they, they form these actin bundles, and they kind of stick out and start to kind of feel their way around the environment. Is there more growth factor here? No. 
they'll stick out another one. Is there more growth factor here? Yes, and I'll keep moving over here until I get yelled at for moving away from the mic. So here, you know, so we use closure for all this stuff now, actually. Uh, the simulation, it's C++, I have to admit. But it, there, there is some utility to have at that speed. But I do link back to it through JNI, so it still is all closure, I can claim. Okay, so here, this is a mouse hind brain, um, a blood vessel. And so what you're seeing on the, you see this kind of long red strand. And so this is these philopodia from these two different, two different kind of primary vessels. They're starting to seek out each other, and they're kind of discovering that, oh, we can make a connection here. And that will, I don't know, I'd, you know, this was, the, you can't actually grow this tissue afterwards. This has been fully fixed in paraffin and wax, et cetera. Um, so we don't know what would have happened, but you know, it might have actually led to the formation of a thicker blood vessel along this line. Um, so we do this to extract in order to actually count the philopodia when we're tuning our simulation then in order to, well, we want our simulations to produce the same philopodia at the same length, same rates, et cetera. Uh, so we do that, that's all enclosure. So there's, here's a little, a little bit more biology, but I don't go too much more into it. So you have this growth factor, this VEGF in the environment, and you grow towards that. And then cells talk to each other through this delta notch signaling pathway. And that's, that's the only signaling pathway I'll talk about. But this is, a, this is a deep one, this is really fundamental. It's how your spine is formed, it's how, it's how uh, your organs are, are compartmentalized early in embryogenesis. It's, it's a very, very fundamental pathway to you can even find it in flies, but you, it's certainly in fish, mammals, etc. cetera. Um, it's an, there are analogs in flies. So this type of study that we've been working on, and I'll get to it, scaling it up, um, is so we look at how timing patterns out and how different cell types pattern out in these situations when you, you tune philopodia, you tune coupling between neighboring cells, etc. cetera. Uh, so this was pure C++. Uh, but here, let me get to the, the fancy closure -y kind of stuff. So yes, the retina is one model of angiogenesis, but another one that we tend to think about uh, that we focus on a lot is zebrafish. Zebrafish are you know, the, the kind of staple landmark of, of experimental biology. Why? Because they're transparent. So when you're doing developmental biology, you don't have to do anything to the animal. You just start growing it. You put it under a microscope, and you can just record it live and just watch things grow. I mean, generally, they're fluorescently tagged, so you can actually see things more precisely. Um, so, but in, when you're talking about vascular biology, you care about this, these ISVs, these intersegmental vessels they are forming along the back. They're just connecting two primary vessels, a dorsal aorta and a vein at the top. Um, so here's what we do, and this is the simulation that's now, now working with closure. Um, so this is kind of the, form, the initial formation of an of a ISV. Um, so we make a corresponding simulation with our little cell simulator, and we have this type of migration simulation. So we, we've gotten our biologists to, you know, since these are zebrafish, you can record these over time. We, they take a whole bunch of image frames. Now we make our simulations. These aren't, mind you, I, I have to admit, this is not image-driven simulation here. I have that, that's a little more complicated to do for this. Uh, this is tuned based on the biologically measured cell movement rates. Um, but let me play it. It starts off a little slow because I have to kind of warm it up and kind of let it, uh, let it you know, overwrite its kind of initial values because there's a lot happening in the gene regulatory network. So it's putting out these philopodia, kind of starting to explore its environment. There's this growth factor gradient that's going from top to bottom where you know, it's, higher, it's much higher at the top. Um, but basically, as you move in the Y direction, though, you know, that's, that's the direction you want to go. So you get these kind of cool, uh, cool, interesting cells. They start to expand their membrane, and they move in this upward direction. And we've tuned them to the, match the rates. And we, I, I'm actually only allowed to show wild-type scenarios of this situation. But the, the biologists, clearly, one of the things they do is they apply treatments to these that will modify the cell growth rates, et cetera. Um, and so, so I, I, I can't really get into those, but you know, we can, because it's simulation, we can, we can adapt geometries and modify how, thing, how cells talk to each other, et cetera. So, uh, so we control that with entirely closure at this point, uh, but, it's, but it's a C++ engine. Okay, so my conclusions. I hope I didn't go too fast, but. So and the, we have this Brevis simulator. Um, we've done some, some robotic simulations with it, but this, this code broke now because the, 
I don't like maintaining the rigid body library, the rigid body physics library. Uh, but if anyone wants to pick that up, I'd love that. Um, so uh, we have this chemical computer. We do some, some simulations in that in order to actually see what happens when you connect larger circuits together. But that's incredibly complicated to deal with when you start talking about uh, actual physical simulations. It, it took five years for us to make that computer. Um, and you saw it's only performing a single NOR operation across five minutes. Um, and so in these patterns of perception, so now we're using closure entirely to do our image analysis on, on biological samples. I just came back from a medical meeting where I was doing that. I, started, uh, I now actually work with biopsies, so we can take a biopsy from a human, we scan it and use closure for that. Um, and we can take measurements of how healthy is this patient or not. Um, and then we get into this, uh, this computational biology where we do you know, these forward predictions about what happens under different developmental scenarios. Uh, yes, so thank you.